Amen. Good morning. Today we're putting a comma on this Philippian series and we're gonna pick it back up next year sometime and uh, it's gonna be part two of the series as my staff uh, labeled it in the document, Tokyo Drift, Philippians 2. For those who know that joke, uh, we'll come back then. But uh, we're gonna put a comma today after we study about salvation. And you know, I told you this last week, uh, yesterday was the 20 year mark for me Uh, 20 years ago, surrendering my life to Jesus. And you know, whenever you come to that spiritual marker in your life, whether it be supernatural or physical or emotional or relational, it's good to reflect on things leading up to that, which is what I did. I started to think about my life prior to coming to Christ. And for those who don't know, I was actually raised in a very religious Roman Catholic home, uh, which meant we went to church every single Sunday I was raised to take my first communion and see the priest in a confessional booth in the age uh, or in the grade of the second grade. Uh, I made my first confirmation at the age of 14. I went to a co-ed Catholic school up until the seventh grade when they asked me kindly to leave the school uh, because I was uh, overreacting and uh, undiagnosed ADHD. And so my parents said, we're gonna fix this. We're gonna put him in an all boys Catholic high school run by the brothers with paddles who were ready for wiggly little boys who got out of line. And boy, that changed my attitude quickly. Remember the day of the paddles? Anybody remember those days? Might need to bring them back. Am I with you? I'm playing, I'm playing, but seriously. Uh, I went to to a Catholic high school. I went to a Southern Baptist college where I took classes on theology and doctrine and uh, came home every weekend and I would spend time in my my home with my family and go back to the church on Sunday. And the entire time through this process, for 26 years, I was lost. I wasn't born again. And some of you are there. You're like, man, I checked the attendance box. I've been to church. I know know, uh, some of the Bible stories. I've been to Bible class. And and you're lost today too. And how do you know? The, the, The difference was I didn't have life change. I started to look at my life and I realized that I was living no different than my unbelieving friends who were partying every weekend, who never went to church and who professed to be atheists and far from God. And I wanna ask you today, as you examine your own life today, wouldn't you agree those of us who quote, profess Christ should be living and looking different than those who don't? And there should be a marked difference between those of us who are living for God and those of us or those who are not living for God. And so in just a few moments, I just wanna prepare your heart. God is going to call some of you to surrender your life to him. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond to that as we've already seen uh, in our services, uh, last service at the beginning uh, or the end of the first service, sorry, uh, a founding member of Long Hollow uh, by the name of Gerald Wagner. You may know Brother Gerald, he works the parking lot, he's a precious dear soul, been a deacon at Long Hollow in years past. He was the first one up, before I even gave the invitation, Gerald was standing here. I'm thinking, Gerald, what are you doing? The sermon's not over, I'm literally standing here. And at the end of the message, Gerald said, Pastor Robbie, since I was 15 years old, Brother Harrison, first pastor at Long Hollow, asked me if I've given my life to Christ. And I said, yes, but I wasn't baptized. Gerald's in his 80s. Praise God for the obedience of a brother. Amen. In the first service, who came forward and and went through uh, obedience and baptism. So I wanna prepare your heart, that may be you. You may say, hey pastor, my baptism's on the wrong side of my salvation or I haven't fully surrendered my life to Christ. Today we're gonna talk about what it means to be saved. What does salvation look like? And so if you have a Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter two. This will be our final sermon in the book of Philippians for this year. And wouldn't it be amazing that as we end this Philippians series, new life in Christ would begin for someone in here. Be a new beginning, a new chapter for you. Philippians chapter two, verse 12, if you're there, we like to say word at Long Hollow. If you're at home, you can say word as well. Thank you. you. The word of the Lord. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed. Now that's the key word, circle that, highlight in your Bible if you're taking notes or in your on your iPad or iPhone or or Android uh, or flip phone. So now, not only, probably probably not in the flip phone. So now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. I wanna begin by talking about how salvation in this text is demonstrated by God. God is gonna demonstrate for us and explain to us what salvation is, and he talks about it being a both and effect. And before we get into the text, let me just teach you a little bit about how to study the Bible. So whenever you come to a biblical passage, it's important to keep the text in the context of which it was written. Meaning that, in seminary we used to say it this way, a text taken out of its context becomes a pretext for a proof text. This is a cute way to say that if you take a text out of its context, then you can make it say whatever you wanna prove. If you don't believe me, just turn on TBN. Not everybody, but some people, right? I mean, they can say whatever they want. And, and it's important for us to just take the text in the context. So Paul has a context here for this passage. And there are two points that are gonna bring this to life. The first is this, Paul begins his train of thought in chapter one, verse 27. So go back up to 127 and put a bracket, a bracket up top. And he continues this argument all the way through to chapter two, verse 18. Now we laughingly said a couple weeks ago, Paul says just one thing, you see in the text. And then he gives a bunch of things, but he's still talking about one thing. And the one theme he's talking about, audience participation is what? What is the one theme he's talking about? Unity in the community of faith. Paul's saying, listen, we as the people of God should be unified together. We should be working together, not against each other. Let me remind you, we're on the same team in here, amen? And even churches and pastors who are different and, and worship different and gather different, we're all on the same team. When First Baptist succeeds, we all succeed. When uh, Freedom Church succeeds, we all succeed. When Cornerstone succeeds, we all, they're, all of us are in this thing together, amen? We gotta realize that. Paul says, listen, let's stop fighting and infighting. The second insight in the text that really brings it to life is the fact that Paul doesn't use singular pronouns Actually, the word you throughout the text, this is gonna be surprising, is plural. Did you know that? If Paul were from Middle Tennessee, he would say y'all, right? What do you mean? Just as y'all have obeyed, work out y'all's salvation with fear and trembling. That has a ring to it, huh? What he's talking about is, he's, no, I'm not saying salvation is not personal. It's always personal, but it's never private. Your salvation is public whether you want it to be or not. What he's saying is this. He's saying we should be able to get, to get, get along with the body of Christ. If we claim to be saved and cannot get along with each other, how can those who are outside of salvation expect to have what we have? Would, would our lives draw people to Christ or are we repelling people from Christ? What he's talking about is salvation. And before we get into it, let me just define uh, what I mean by salvation. Before, and this is kind of basic, but it has to be understood. Before a person can be truly saved from anything, they have to realize that they're lost. Okay? It's a big deal. Because a lot of us want to get saved, but we don't know we're lost. Does anyone remember a day before Google Maps on your iPhone? Now, young people, stay with me. You're gonna say, really? No, just stay with me. There was a day before uh, there was Waze. Who knew, right? There was a day before that annoying Garmin device with that, with that girl who would just speak to you over and over, rerouting, rerouting, make an immediate U-turn, if pot. Remember those days? You know, that Garmin device. There was a day, believe it or not, when we actually traveled with a paper map. Can I get an amen? Anybody with me? You all remember? I mean, believe it or not, those were days. And the way it worked in my family was dad was always the self-appointed designated driver. Mom was the map keeper. Dad was always gonna drive and dad had one policy and that was we don't ask for directions. Anybody had a day like that? By golly, I've been here before, we're gonna get here. And dad was always on a mission to break last year's time <laughs> without getting pulled over, obviously. No offense, Brandon, but that's what... Sorry, but that's what he would do. He would just try to break last year's time in the speed limit, of course, right? <laughs> Maybe not. But anyway, dad would never stop. And like most of your dads, dad would just figure it out. And normally we would be lost. You know, mom had the map and she would kindly lean over and say, honey, um, 
I think we're lost. And dad would say, nope, right on track as usual. You know, just kind of cruise along. Mom, mom would say, no, no, honey, you missed, you missed the turn back here. And dad would say something like this. No, surely there's an intersection that connects back. I mean, let's just keep driving, right? Anybody with me? And then finally, you knew the wheels had completely fallen off when dad had to pull into the 7-Eleven, right? Anybody remember those, the old 7-Elevens, right? And when dad would pull in, I, I mean, sometimes the 7-Eleven was actually more hurtful than helpful. I remember one time, you know, in there and trying to find directions and guy, oh yeah, you, you missed a turn. You got to go back there about two stops. You need to take a right and then veer off there to the left. You need to go down about two or so miles to that where the old Miller barn used to be. And you're going to take that hard right right there. And you'll be right back on track on that interstate. You got it? Yeah, I think we got it. I think we got it, right? I mean, you leave more confused than before. But here's the point I want to make. Just like dad had to admit that he was lost before he could seek help, you have to acknowledge that you're lost in your sin before God can save you. Before God can rescue you, you have to confess, which means to agree with, you have to confess that you're lost. Now, you hear this terminology in the church, lost, that person's lost, what does it mean? It simply means a person who cannot find their way in and of themselves to God. It means a person who is separated from God. It means a person who doesn't have intimacy with God. It means a person who is unsaved or not saved. You've heard that word, saved. And just growing up, I remember as a Christian, uh, I remember this was like the hotbed word in my, 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 uh, my Roman Catholic home at the time because we didn't use that terminology in, in, in Catholicism. Maybe with you didn't use that terminology. In fact, when somebody would say to me, are you saved? I would say, I'm Catholic. Remember that? I don't know what that means, but there's, I'm Catholic, and I would say that too. And my mom and dad would say that, and I just remember, because I was so fired up, you know, I'm saved now, I'm born again, I want mom and dad to be, I want aunt and uncle, I want my sister to be born again. And so I'd say, mom, you need to be saved. And she'd say, saved from what? She'd say, what are you talking about? We've always gone to church, son. You're the one who's straight, you know? We've always been a part of God. You're the one who turned your back. You were the one who was lost. You were the one who went into sin with drug and alcohol. We have always been good with God. Now, we've heard people say that before, right? And it sounds good, but it's biblically inaccurate. Why? Because the Bible is clear. Every single person in here, and for that matter, everyone who's ever walked the face of the earth, the Bible says is lost and in need of redemption to be saved. Every one of us. The Bible also says everybody in here who doesn't have salvation for their souls is under the judgment and condemnation of God, whether you do anything about it or not, and will be eternally separated from him in a Christless place called hell. That's what the Bible says. And if you don't believe me, I'll just show you a, a couple of scriptures. Ephesians chapter two, verses one and two. This is Paul writing. And you were dead prior to Christ. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Do you know what the Greek word there for dead means? Anybody know? Dead, that's what it means, dead. Doesn't take a seminary. <laughs> I mean, that was pretty simple, right? And what it means is when a person is dead in a coffin, the only way that dead person can come back to life is if someone outside of themselves, namely God, resuscitates or resurrects them. And here's the crazy thing about being dead. The person who's dead doesn't realize they're dead. And the crazy thing is in the group this size or those watching online, you are dead, some of you, and you don't even know you're dead. And the Bible says you better recognize this. Why? Because we all are dead. Why? Because of our trespasses and sins in which we used to walk according to the ways of the world according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience or in the disobedient. Colossians 1.21. You were once alienated in the past, alienated, separated from God, hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions. Ephesians chapter two, verse 12. At this time, you were without Christ, before Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. For those of you who are presently lost, this is you. You're alienated, you're separated, no hope without God. Uh, Isaiah chapter 59, verse two, but your iniquities are separating you from your God. That's what he says. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not listen to you. You wanna know why God doesn't listen to you? Because he doesn't know you. 
And more importantly, you don't know him. So, so you gotta understand what it means to be lost. It's not that if you're lost over time, you can work your way to find God eventually. That's not how it works. In fact, the harder you try in and of your own strength, the worse it becomes for you. It's kind of like a person who's stranded at sea in the middle of the ocean and there's no land in sight. The worst thing they can do is start paddling harder. Why? Because it will mean inevitable quicker death. But pastor, I don't, I don't have a testimony like you. I wasn't a drug addict. It's a normal response, you know. I wasn't as bad as you. I grew up in church. I've been, I've been to camp. I went to VBS. I'm good with God. I don't need God. You wanna know the fastest way to hell? I, I, I believe this. There's no quicker way to hell than to live a comfortable life. What do you mean? A, a suburban house, a, a car in the garage, a, a family, uh, a family of, of a boy and a girl, you're a soccer mom, you're a football dad, you have your kids in your local school. You don't need God because you're comfortable. Why? Because a comfortable person never comes to God. They don't need him. They have everything in and of themselves. And while I wouldn't go back and redo all the turmoil and pain from addiction and separation from God, I am thankful I went through it. Anybody with me? Because sometimes God has to bring you, look at me, so low, like he brought me, where the only place for me to look was up. And I know in a group this size, there is someone, there's someone or maybe many people who are at the point of breaking. You are right now at the breaking point and that is the best place to be for you. Because you feel like, man, it's overwhelming. I'm hanging on by a thread. I don't know what to do. I'm about to throw in the towel. And God says, hang in there. Why? Because it's breakthrough that leads God, oh, I'm sorry, it's brokenness that leads to breakthrough. That's how God works. It's the brokenness of your life that God uses to break through for blessing. Another way to say it is God uses repentance for personal revival. And so you may be saying, I don't know why all this is happening. Well, God's trying to get your attention. If you're like me, I'm pretty hard-headed. God has to keep teaching me, right, the lesson over and over. I mean, salvation is simply this, if I can reduce it down to, to this. Salvation is not adding Jesus to your already comfortable life. In fact, it's not adding Jesus to anything. Like you don't say, I think I'll try Jesus for happiness or joy or satisfaction or wealth or health. No, here's what salvation is. Salvation is God transferring you from the domain of darkness serving Satan now into the kingdom of God under the light of the gospel. That's what it means. It's God moving you from trying to think you can earn favor with him to you receiving the grace of God in your life. And here's what you realize. When you're truly saved, you say, I didn't deserve this. I didn't earn it. I don't even know why you call me. Friends, you don't earn salvation by being baptized. We love people falling through with baptism, but I tell them all in the tank, you know baptism doesn't save you. But what baptism does is tell the church and the world you're not ashamed of following Jesus. It's an outward expression of an inward desire to follow Christ. We don't earn salvation through baptism. We don't earn salvation by going to church. We don't earn salvation by receiving communion. We don't earn salvation by praying or giving. If our acceptance by God was based on our good works, then it no longer ceases to be a gift received, but a wage earned. Do you see the difference? Salvation is no longer a gift received by God. It's a wage earned by God. And grace ceases to be grace the moment you work for it. You gotta realize, when you and I get to heaven, we're not gonna say, man, I'm so glad I'm here because I was more intellectual than my friends or I was sharper than my former drug addict friends who didn't make it or, man, I studied the Bible or I had good parents or, man, I made a decision to follow Jesus. If that's the case, then if you say that, who gets the credit, you or God? God, I mean you, sorry, thank you, you threw me off. When you get to heaven, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna bow the knee and you're gonna say, listen, I don't know why I'm here and I don't deserve to be here. It wasn't anything I did. The only reason I'm here is because of you, because of you. And that's why Paul says, for by grace, you've been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not as a result of work so that no one can boast. I want to show you how many times he tries to get this point across. Grace means free, means undeserved, unmerited favor from God. 
by saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. You didn't do anything to earn it. It's a gift from God. You didn't do anything to receive it. Not from, you think he's trying to get his point across? Like if you didn't hit it the first time by grace, let me say it again, not of yourselves, okay, you got it. It is a gift of God free. And oh, by the way, not from works, why? So that no one can boast. Here's how you know, watch this. Here's how you know you're earning salvation or trying to. Here's how you know. I'm gonna ask you one question. Here's the question. Are you going to heaven? Here's how you know. Diagnostic question. Are you going to heaven? How you answer that question determines whether you get there or not, I think, but determines a lot about your own heart. And if you say something like this, yeah, I'm going to heaven. I've lived a decent life. I, I've gone to church when I can. I tried to raise my kids in a Christian home. I tried to share Christ at the school I've gone to. Uh, I've been to youth group from time to time. I've gone to VBS and camp. I've given the little money I've had to the church to God. And I've tried to do more good than bad over the course of my life. Yeah, I think I'm going to heaven. The answer is no. Why? Because all of the things you told me were works that you did. Friends, you and I are not going to heaven based on our denominational involvement or affiliation. Doesn't matter what religion, uh, you're not going to heaven because you're Baptist, and some Baptists are gonna have a hard time when they get to heaven and realize there are other denominations there, right? I mean, it's like, thought we only Baptists here, right? And you're not, going to, you're not going to heaven because you're Catholic. You're not going to heaven because you're Methodist or Presbyterian or Pentecostal or full gospel. You're going to heaven because of Jesus. And remember, by the way, I jokingly tell people, do you know Jesus was Jewish, by the way? He wasn't any of these things. You're not going to heaven because of your grandfather or grandmother or the faith of your spouse or the faith of your parents. It's the individual decision that you make to follow Jesus. You're not going to heaven because of church attendance. You're not going to heaven because you've gone on a mission trip. You've not, you're not going to heaven because of the amount of money you've given, how much of the Bible you know, or whether you've been naughty or nice. If you think that, you better think twice. Why? Because the only reason we go to heaven is because of Jesus. Friends, look at me. If you believe that you're going to heaven because you're a good person, I say this with love, you're probably not going to heaven. Because here's why. If you think it's based on your good works or your merit, then when you stand before the Lord Jesus one day and give an account for your life, you're gonna put your life forward as the representation and your good life up against Christ's perfect life fails miserably. See, what you need is for Jesus to hide you behind his cross so that the Father, who's the judge, don't, doesn't see you but see Christ. You need Jesus to be your advocate on that day to stand up for your sin. Here's what you need to say. Father, don't hold Robbie's sin against him. I know he sinned. Charge that one to my account, Daddy. I paid for it on the cross. Friends, that's what you need. And that's why Jesus, when he died, he said these words, it is finished. Aren't you glad he didn't say one day it'll be finished or then it was finished in the past? No, he said, it is finished. It's finished in the present. It's finished in the past. And praise God, our sins are washed forevermore in eternity future, right? Amen. And so here's the deal. Look at me. The only assurance you and I have that we're going to heaven, this is it, is to acknowledge before a holy God that we're lost. And we need him to save us from our sin. I know what you're saying. That seems pretty simple, very simple, but profound. Now, up to this point, if you're paying attention to the Bible reading, you're like, okay, I know we need to be saved. I get that. But, and I know that I didn't do anything to earn it. I don't deserve it. But didn't you just read the passage you read to us? Because the passage you just read to us said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So the question is, are we working our salvation or is it God working in us? And the answer is what? Yes, to both, right? Which is the second point. Not only does salvation, uh, something we didn't do, we don't earn, God demonstrates it in, in his son coming to earth, so it's not anything we do. But the flip side is salvation is, it demands a response from us. So salvation is demonstrated by God, but it demands a response from us. Philippians chapter two, verse 12, again, watch this. Therefore, just as you have always obeyed, keyword, 
So now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Now, the key word here I mentioned earlier is obeyed. What he's talking about is this. So the question is, do we work for salvation or not? We don't work to earn our salvation. The moment we work to earn our salvation, it ceases to be grace. However, the moment you and I cross the threshold of salvation, we will begin to work for God, not trying to earn something, but because we already have everything in Jesus Christ. So a better way to think of it is this, write this down, my rendering. Live out your salvation. You can write it in your Bible, it helps me. Live out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because, because workout makes me think of like a punch card or a time clock or office hours. I'm like, working out. But live out is this idea that we're all gonna live out something. And I would say every person in here is either going toward Jesus or away from him. So you're living in one of two ways. And Paul says, but when you live, you need to do it with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling is, has been misunderstood because we think to be scared of God. You know, he's overwhelming, he's domineering, he's like a father out to get me, whip me at every moment. That's not what Paul means. Although there is some form of being reverent to God, he's talking about respect. He's not talking about horror and angst, he's talking about respect and honor. And I don't know about you, but I think today in America, we have lost reverence for God, amen? We've lost, nobody's, nobody's fearful of God anymore. Nobody has any respect for God anymore. And I will tell you this, if you have a fear of man or woman online or in person at the office in the neighborhood, I would submit it's probably because you don't have a healthy fear of God. Because if you fear God, the Bible says you never fear man. Why? Because God will fight your battles for you. Another thing is we don't obey scripture to earn something from God. The moment we do that, we, 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 we're trying to earn something. God owes us something. So the natural question becomes, why do we work for God? Why do we obey the scriptures? Why do we serve the Lord? Why do we follow the 10 commandments in our life? Here's why. It's not because we'll lose our salvation. It's because we don't wanna hurt, we don't wanna lose the intimacy we have with the Father, okay? The intimacy we have with the Father is based on our obedience. And I don't know about you, but I don't wanna do anything to hinder the communion I have with God. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I don't sin, not because, of, watch this. I don't sin, not because of what God will do to me through punishment, but of what God won't do through me in usefulness. Let me say it again. I'm not, I'm not sinning. I mean, yeah, I'm fearful of God. And yes, I know there are consequences. But the reason I, I, I seek the Lord in holiness and righteousness and obedience is not because of what God would do to me in judgment, but because of what God wouldn't do through me in usefulness. I don't know about you. I want to be used by God. And there's a kind of FOMO here for me, right? Y'all you know, you know FOMO, the fear of missing out. And I think FOMO for Christians should be the fear of missing out on being used by God. You should have a healthy fear every day that you don't wanna waste your life. Friends, listen, you don't get a do-over. You can't reset the video game. <laughs> you can't close the app and get back in when you lose or die. On it. It's one shot, right? And the way you live here determines the reality of eternity. And like you, I know many of you saying, I don't wanna miss out on what God is doing in my life. So for Paul, salvation is not just thinking on two hands, which I've taught you. For Paul, salvation is thinking on three hands, right? It's like, a, not just two, but three. And here's what I mean. For Paul, salvation is a past tense event, a present tense reality, and a future promise. I had a friend at seminary, every time at lunch, I mean, I'm just telling you, his name was Sean, he'd wait for me at lunch at the table. Every time at lunch, I'd get my tray at seminary and I'd sit down, he'd say, all right, Galilee, here's the deal. Is it salvation? Is it, a, this is his words, a punctiliar point in time? Or is it a process? And I'd say, Sean, it's both. It cannot be both, Galilee, it cannot be. This is his mind, you know? So for some of you, you're gonna say, it cannot be both, it cannot be trice, it can't be threefold, but I'm telling you, for Paul, it is. For Paul, it's past, present, and future. Number one, write this down. This is a theological uh, explanation. So write this down, you wanna go back to this. For Paul, salvation is a past encounter where God saved you from the penalty of sin. 
God saved you from the penalty of sin. This is a big word called justification. I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna give you a systematic theology lesson and soteriology in five minutes, hopefully. I got five minutes left. Let's do it quick. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. And then the next verse says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. So in the past, God saved us from the penalty of sin. Here's another one, Colossians 2.14. He erased the certificate of debt in the past with its obligations that was against us and opposed us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. Now, this is hard to wrap your mind around, but the moment you and I confess our belief in Jesus and ask him and invite him into our life, at that moment, he removes the penalty that every man and woman has to pay for sin. He doesn't hold our past against us at that point. Aren't you glad for that? Amen, like he doesn't hold like our past against us. And so when we talk about salvation at this point, the natural question becomes, okay, I get it. Can you lose that salvation? You've heard this before. Okay, I get it. You, can, you get salvation from Christ. The question is, can you lose it? And I've studied this probably more than many concepts in the Bible. I've written two chapters on it in a book called Firmly Planted. I've really done research on this. And here's what I've found by studying the Bible. It's a very simple argument. I'm gonna make it a philosophical argument, just simple, practical argument. And here's the argument. Either works are a part of your salvation equation or they're not. But you can't have either or, okay? It's either, it's either it's one or the other. Meaning we cannot say that we are saved apart from good works on the front end and yet we can unravel our salvation with bad works on the back end. It just doesn't make any sense when you think about it this way. Like you can't say, okay, we don't believe you could be good enough to be saved, but you could be bad enough to lose salvation. And my suggestion to you is this, it's either works or not, you can't have it both ways, right? Here's a, here's a way to think of it. Salvation equation is not, Jesus plus works is not salvation, why? Because it's not Jesus plus works. It's not Jesus plus baptism. It's not Jesus plus church membership. I left out. It's not Jesus plus speaking in tongues with the evidence of the Holy Spirit. It's not Jesus plus communion. I figured I hit everybody. It's not Jesus plus confession to a clergy. It's not Jesus plus a denomination. Here's the equation. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the equation, amen? The moment you try to add Jesus to something, it ceases to be salvation. So here's the mindset. You cannot lose something you did nothing to earn in the first place. Now, the way you think of it is, once you're adopted into the family of God, once you've been grafted into the root, as it says in Romans 11, you cannot unadopt yourself from the family. Now, you can act like a wayward son or daughter in the pig pen like the prodigal, but you can never not cease to be a son or a daughter. I like to say it this way. It's not once, it's not if saved, always saved. You always hear somebody say, if saved, always saved. Well, there's a lot of ifs if he was saved or not. Well, we like to say is once saved, always saved. Once you're truly saved, you're always saved. Here's the million dollar question, and I can't answer it, you can. Are you saved? Are you born again? Have you gone from being a creation, in Christ, or a creation in the world that's sought yourself and, and sin and become a new creation in Christ and the old has passed away and the new has become, or are you still living like the way you used to? So for Paul, salvation is a past event. It's also a present reality. This is, that is justification. This is sanctification. This present reality, right, watch this, is you being saved from the power of sin in your life today. Sanctification is the word that means separation. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to those of us who are being saved. Now, wait a minute. You just said you were saved in eternity past before the foundation of the world, but now you're saying you are being saved. The answer is, which one is it? And the answer is what? Yes, to both, right? See, friends, God continues to sanctify us the longer we're a believer. When the Holy Spirit moves into your heart and resides in your life and fills you with his presence, he will lead you toward holiness. That's what he does. Think of the Holy Spirit, not a minimized way. He's like a homing pigeon. 
just, just thinking this off the cuff. I didn't say this before, but it just came. It, he, he comes in your life, and the only thing he wants to do is get back to God. You're gonna be on an upward mobility back toward God. And here's why I say that. If your life, and here's the hard part of the message I want you to digest. If you're not more like Christ today, if you profess to be a Christian, than you were a month ago or a year ago or 10 years ago, I would question if you're a Christian. Now, I'm not saying you're gonna not mess up. I'm not saying you're not gonna backslide. I'm not saying you're gonna fall and stumble. What I'm saying is the totality of your life should be in a direction toward God, and you should be progressively, progressively moving toward God. Here's a way to think of it. You should have more mastery over sin today than you did when you were a new believer. If you're so plagued by persistent, consistent sin like you were as an unbeliever, quote, prior to saying a prayer, I would question if it was a genuine prayer. And coming back to God is always the same, whether it's first time or it's the, you know, wandering away, it's always the same. It's repenting of your sin and believing that Jesus saves your soul and confessing and acknowledging before him. Number three, it's not only just a past experience, not only a present reality, number three, it's a future promise. And that is one day we're gonna be saved from the presence of sin. This is such a good encouragement here. And this is the big word glorification. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Here's the promise, Romans chapter five, verse nine. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? What he's saying is there's coming a day when we will be saved. Now here's the promise. Jesus Christ is coming back sooner than we think. Don't you agree with that? He's coming back soon, okay? and he's gonna redeem us from this sinful world. And at that moment, when Jesus' feet touched down on earth, the decision you made for him, look at me, or the lack thereof is going to seal your eternal destiny forever. And when Jesus comes back, there's no do-over, there's no purgatory, there's no limbo, there's no give me another chance, it's sealed for eternity, and once he comes back, there are two options. If you profess faith in Jesus prior to that, you have bowed the knee to him as Lord and Savior willingly. If you rejected that, which you have a right to do, and Jesus comes back on that day for the second coming, it's too late, you will be forced to bow the knee to him as judge. But here's the promise, Paul says, when Jesus comes back, his presence signifies no more presence of sin. And I don't know about you, that's what C.S. Lewis said, is the greatest gift of heaven. Can you imagine a day when there's no sin? There's no pain, there's no suffering, there's no sickness. Now, if you are like me this week as I was studying for this, if you're a little overwhelmed at the topic, then you're in good company. Anybody say, man, up to that point, that's a lot of stuff. Anybody would say, that's a lot of stuff we just learned. Raise your hand. If not, you're a liar. <laughs> Maybe you're smarter than, than, than we are. But I was studying this week and I'm like, wow, that's a lot of stuff to understand about salvation. And, and, and it reminded me, whoever set, suggested that we can know everything about God probably doesn't know everything about God or doesn't know God to begin with. It, listen, it's okay to not know everything and to just be overwhelmed with the mystery of, of, of God. And let's think of it this way. If you knew everything about God, he wouldn't be a God you'd wanna worship anyway, right? There's certain concepts in the Bible I don't understand. Even today, I don't, I don't understand them, I've studied them, and that's okay. See, the problem today is we have lost in our modern culture the ability to appreciate and to recognize mystery. We've lost it. Because in our culture, we've been taught you have to figure out everything, especially young people. Like there's an answer to everything. In our Alexa asking and iPhone searching culture, if you're with my kids, and you know, back in the day when we were sitting around saying, yeah, who won the 1980s World Series? I think it was the Yankees. No, it wasn't the Yankees, it was the Mets. Well, we just had to believe somebody. Like, I don't know, we'll get home and look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Remember that there? <laughs> Which we didn't, but yeah. Today, what do your kids do? Oh, I know, hold on. I got it right here. Let me look it up on my phone. And they can Google anything at any moment at any time, and they can find an answer. Now, if you take that mindset 
and you superimpose that onto your Christian life, what happens is you lose the reverence and humility that God wants us to have before him. And a lot of people will say, well, I don't understand God, so I can't believe in a God and I don't understand him. My response is you're never gonna understand God and if you did, you wouldn't wanna believe in him. There's just some things about God we don't understand, but I'm okay with that. Friends, listen, think about this. You and I cannot understand how salvation works. The fact that God saved the man 20 years ago who didn't deserve it, he didn't earn it, he wasn't seeking God, he was a drug addict and alcohol. The fact that one day on November 11th, 2002, I went from a drug addict and former alcoholic, separated from God, and the next day I was a new creation in Christ. How did that happen? I don't know. But I know it happened, just like you. There was a day in your life that you were alienated from God, separated from Him under the dominion of Satan, and yet the next day you went to be a born again, new creation in Christ. How does that happen? Only God knows. And I'm okay with that. Only God understands how he can take someone who's helpless and homeless and hopeless and addicted and busted and disgusted and turn them into a new creation in Christ. Only God can give life to dead men and women. Only God can take someone from darkness to light. Only God can restore marriage, heal a relationship and give peace to those who are hurting. And I don't know how it works, but I trust. And some of you are saying, well, how in the world can reciting a prayer, really just reciting a prayer right now, change and make any difference in my life? That's what some of you are thinking. And I don't know how that works, but I know it worked for me. Anybody amen to that? I know it took a simple prayer of acknowledging God of who he was and who I was, and I was radically saved. And here's what I did. When I got saved, you heard earlier, I didn't know the Bible. I mean, I slept through the Christian classes, but I took, watch this, the little bit of faith I had, which wasn't much, and I put it in as much of Jesus as I knew, and I was radically saved, radically saved. And if we could understand it all, listen, it wouldn't be faith, it would be sight. And the Bible says, it is by faith we are saved. So let me just give those who are saying, I gotta understand more. Don't let your intellect prevent you from experiencing salvation today. Don't let your skepticism of the church or Christianity prevent you from encountering the living God today. Don't let your pride paralyze you today. Don't wait to say, I gotta get all my questions answered and then I'll surrender my life to Christ. Friends, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And so I wanna offer it to you today. This is the final sermon in our series, but wouldn't it be cool to surrender your life to Christ and it would be the first day of your new life in Christ. And so I wanna pray for us as we close. Would you just bow your head for a moment? Let's just assume a posture of prayer. There's two, there's two invitations today. The first one is for the person who's tried to earn grace. And if you've tried to earn grace, my, my encouragement to you is to receive the free gift of salvation from Christ today. Because if you tried to earn it, it ceases to be grace and grace is what's needed by faith for you to be saved. And so I'm gonna ask you today to just lay it down and surrender to Christ completely. And the second part is for those in here who are saying, Pastor, you spoke to my heart. I hear the voice of God. And I realize that I need to surrender my life to Christ. Whatever you have, I want. I want to experience Jesus. So I'm going to ask you today, with no one looking around out of respect for those who are here with us, or maybe you're at home, and you're saying, hey, Pastor, I, I, want, I want that. I want to surrender to Christ once and for all. I'm tired of running. I'm worn out. And I'm ready just to relinquish and accept the free gift of salvation that's offered to me. I want Jesus. I don't want a denomination or baptism or church membership or signing a card or walking and I'll, I simply want Jesus. Would you just, brother, be so bold right now or sister, would you just slip your hand up or just extend it high so I can see? And, and you're extending, you're just saying, Pastor Robbie, pray for me. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sir. Just right now, anyone just slip your hand up right where you are, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Anyone else? Maybe you're a student. Maybe you're a deacon in our church like, uh, like Gerald was earlier. Thank you, brother. Anyone else? Pastor Robbie, pray for me. Maybe you're in the balcony. Thank you, brother. 
or there be a woman, thank you. So bold to say, pray for me, thank you. I put off this baptism thing long enough. I've run from God long enough. Listen, if, if God can't trust you to take the first step of obedience in baptism, then how can you expect him to entrust you with greater things later? And so I'm gonna ask one more time, just a moment longer. Pastor Robbie, just pray for me. Right, right where you are, just slip your hand up high so I can see. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you, brother. Anyone else? Hands all over the place. I've already made it easy for you. In the balcony. Thank you. Amen. I see that hand. Praise God. If you raise the hand, no one looking around but those who raised the hand, would you, would you just look at me for a moment? Just raise your hand one more time so I can see you so I know where to look. Praise God. Just raise it high. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out. I promise. I'm just going to talk to you. Praise God. Just raise your hand high. If your hand's raised, I just want you to stand right where you are so I can see you. Just stand right, just right now. Stand where you are so I can look at you. Praise God. Right where you are. Just stand up, brother. Praise God. I just want to look at you. No one looking but those who are standing. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Just stand where you are. I'm gonna pray over you. And this is what I wanna ask you. Yeah, just stand back up, praise God. Here's what I'm gonna ask you. I'm not asking you to do anything that I didn't do when I was in a very similar situation like you. And I'm telling you, who would have thought 20 years ago, a simple step of faith of walk to God would turn out like the last 20 years. I wouldn't have believed it if God would have told me. I wouldn't have believed it. But it's amazing with one decision, my parents and I were talking last night with Candy and the boys, one decision, think about this, changes the course of your life for eternity. Think about that. Think of one decision in your life. And I promise you, this is the biggest decision, the single biggest decision of your life. And so here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna pray over you. I wanna pray personally. I'm gonna ask you to come join me down here. We're just gonna kneel right here at the front. And so would you just make your way out of your seat? Praise God. Just come, brother, sister. And I'm just gonna pray over you. If you're in the balcony, would you come as well? We're gonna wait for you. If you need to grab the hand of your spouse, uh, you come too. If you need to grab the hand of your parents, you come. Praise God. Amen. If you need to come, amen. People are already coming. Sister, you come if the Lord's leading you. Just want you to be obedient to the voice of God. If you hear God's voice, he reminded me yesterday when I speak in a small, still voice, I'm determining if you're obedient so I could speak with a louder volume. And so if you hear the voice of God, you come. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. You come. Don't miss this moment. You may never experience a moment quite like this, so don't miss this moment. If you need to come, you come. Let me pray for us now. You just pray with me if you're at your seat, Father. We just pray. We don't know, we don't know the past. We don't know the testimonies. We don't know where these men and women are, but we do believe that they're coming because they believe there's more to life than this. And then they know right now, God, maybe for the first time, maybe they've known and just haven't obeyed, but they know, God, you're a good God who wants the best for them. And not only in this life, but in the life to come. And God, the one decision we want to not mess around with and get right is the decision to follow Jesus. And so I pray, God, that you radically save these men and women the same way you met me in my room 20 years ago yesterday. And you called someone who wasn't looking for you. And you set me apart and you said, you're going to serve me. And I pray that for them now, God, that they would just feel different. They would you go home and people say, what happened to you? And they say, I don't know. I've been in the presence of Jesus. That's all I can say. And God, you would give them the courage to respond and follow through in obedience, God, to not be ashamed of being baptized, which is the first step, God, after you call us. And so show us we're not ashamed to follow you. God, if we can't stand up in this place surrounded by friends, how can we expect to stand up outside of this place to a lost world? And so give us the courage to do that now. We pray it in the only name we know how. And that's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said,